you've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession on the world's number one chiropractic podcast. Before we dive into this powerful episode, please remember to subscribe to our channels and to give us a five-star rating on iTunes to continue hustling. This episode is sponsored by Imaging Services, Cairo Health USA, Cairo Mobiles, Pure Cairo Notes, Titronics, Sherman College of Chiropractic, New Patients in a Box, The Influencer Authority Podcast Training, Mango Voice, Community Healthcare Resources, Life Chiropractic College West, Trackstat, and Msculpt. Let's hustle. Hey guys, welcome to episode 445 of the Cairo Hustle podcast. I am your producer, Luke Millette, and here's your host, James Chester. So today we have the opportunity of interviewing Stephen Sashin. And if you want to hear the story of how chiropractic and footwear make a match, stay tuned. Welcome back. This is another episode of the Cairo Hustle podcast. We have uh, Steven Sashin here with me today with Zero Shoes. You can see it underneath his uh, screen there. It says zeroshoes.com. I'm really excited to have this guy on the show. I met him at Dave Asprey's uh, biohacking conference, the eighth annual out in uh, Los Angeles, California. Um, episode 445, it's going to be full of uh, Cairo talk, posture talk, uh, bones and feet and uh, upstart and a, a little bit about uh his uh his brand probably a lot about his brand and uh we'll, we'll tell a little shark tank story too yeah, um great. yeah so but before we get into this uh you know i always let people know why Cairo hustle does what we do the big why behind our show um the big thing that resonates with me the most is we protect freedom of speech I think there's a lot of people out there that have agendas and, you know, concepts for doing shows. Um, but really, as I started to develop this five years ago, I started to realize that um, somebody had to like be really proud of the languaging within this profession. And I think that that's really powerful is the language of chiropractic is based on science, philosophy and art and uh, freedom of speech um, and the, the wording and the, the, the lexicon was, is starting to be slowly stripped out of the schools. So, yeah, I know. Right. So I, I, I want us to kind of set a standard for keeping some of these uh, historical contexts, as they call them, alive and well. So one of those being the sacred trust. And those are B.J. Palmer's last words is to protect the sacred trust and guard it well. And he's talking about the, chi the chiropractic profession. So if anybody's out there watching this and they want to learn more about chiropractic, go and search for B.J. Palmer's uh, sacred trust on your favorite search engine. And then, uh, we also, um, Steven, we also, uh, believe in subluxation based chiropractic, which means if there's a misalignment of the joints, putting pressure on something in the nervous system, causing some downstream effect. So I don't live in people's bodies. So I don't know how they feel, but I know that your body's better off not being subluxated. Mm -hmm. And then lastly is that we believe when someone gets adjusted by the chiropractor, it connects man or woman, the physical to man or woman, the spiritual, which is next level stuff. But that's really what the profession of chiropractic was founded upon. So I always offer this up when we open up our show. So people that do get introduced to someone else that's not a chiropractor has a little bit of a resonance as to why the chiropractic profession matters and uh, gives us a good springboard to talk about uh, chiropractic and uh, footwear. So um, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. I mean, there's there are some interesting overlaps between uh, what you just described and what I've been living and experiencing and sharing and discovering over the last 13 years. So this will be fun. Yeah. And chiropractic just had a birthday, September 18th. Uh, it's 127 years young. That's one of my best friend's birthdays. <laughs> well, Founders Day of Chiropractic. Um, we'll never forget it. I love I love that you can actually isolate the day. Yeah. And, you know, for the first like 20 years of the profession, um, they thought that chiropractic chiropractors were ear doctors because the first chiropractic miracle happened to a, a guy named Harvey Lillard and uh, he got adjusted and restored hearing in one of his ears. Oh, fascinating. <laughs> you know, it's funny. 
um, uh, this is going to sound like it's a totally tangential, but it it's, can be dangerous uh, or limiting um, when the first thing that you do becomes popular. And there are a lot of people who will never realize that you are more than that. Um, I mean, our version, we started out our business, we were selling a do-it-yourself sandal making kit, basically how to make a, some footwear the way human beings are making footwear since, well, the beginning of human beings, <laughs> which is something to protect your foot, something to hold it on your foot, maybe some insulation if you needed that. And to this day, you know, over a dozen years later, there are some people who think that's all we do. And we are much, much more than that in many, many ways. Um, but uh, people got hip to what we were doing way back then, and that's still locked in their brain. Well, if you rewind the clock back to that first adjustment, that first 20 years, and they thought that chiropractors were ear doctors. Now, if you fast forward to the past like 30 years or so, they think that chiropractors are just pain doctors. And they think that chiropractors just help with neck pain, back pain, and headaches. Interesting. Right? <laughs> It's, you know, it's so fascinating. One of the things that I've been living for the last 13 years is how do you get people who have a belief to change their belief? And humans are not wired to do that. We're wired to lock onto a belief and stick to it because it's energy inefficient to have to rethink something over and over and over. In back in the days where, you know, you see a blade of grass moving wrong, if you had to think every time, is that something that I can eat or something that's going to eat me? You're getting eaten no matter what. And so um, you can't just tell people they're wrong, you may have noticed. You can't just give people facts, you may have noticed. You have to do really interesting and challenging things. Um, like most advertising, for example, is essentially saying, here's a better version of something you already know, or here's something that when I put these two things together, it's going to be so obvious that you want it. I don't need to say anything else like um, chocolate vitamins. I mean, by the way, we should go into that business. But, um, but when you need to get people to believe something different than what they've been indoctrinated into or what they just learned perhaps incorrectly, you've got to do a whole other thing to highlight how what they've experienced doesn't match what they believe and get them into a state of cognitive dissonance where for many people, they'll have to resolve it by going with what they experience because that's more meaningful and realistic and, uh, and true for them than what they've been taught by some, you know, for example, some big corporation that was lying to them to get their money. Yeah. Um, seeing as believing, right? Sometimes, sometimes believing is what leads to what you see, but, um, hopefully, <laughs> you know, if you see something big enough and often enough, it, it might at least shake you up and go, huh? I, I, I wonder, that's really the goal. The goal is to get people to go, huh? And then you can introduce them to new information. Well, let's introduce people to, to some new information with zero shoes Good segue. And, uh, nice. and, and how uh, chiropractic and footwear work together. Sure. Um, do you want to start or do you want me to start? I want you to start. All right. So, <laughs> so let's do some simple things. Um, so the reason I said there's some interesting overlap is that um, we're here. Wait, I got to grab a shoe. Oh. So here's a kind of, prototypical standard modern athletic shoe it has this pointy toe box mm -hmm. okay so that's not the way your foot is shaped and if it is it's not supposed to be and if it is it's only because you squeezed them into pointy toed shoes so <laughs> let's think about what you're talking about subluxation just now take your entire foot and change the way every joint in your foot of which there are quite a few is misaligned because you've just squeezed things together or don't let them move that's another problem. So this is the fundamental thing that we're trying to do is let your feet be feet. We're trying to let your feet do their job so the rest of your body can do its job. You have a quarter of the bones and joints of your entire body in your feet and ankles. And if you put them in something that misaligns them or doesn't let them move properly, that causes problems unequivocally, undeniably. The research backs this up as well. But I like to half joke and say, it's a shame that we have to do research to essentially prove use it or lose it. But that's what we're having to do in the footwear world. Because again, for the last 50 years, footwear companies have been saying that something that looks like this traditional shoe is somehow good for you, despite the fact that they have repeatedly proven that their footwear causes the injuries they claim to cure. So let's think about posture. Um, this is not rocket science. If you elevate your, someone's heel, that changes your center of mass. That puts strain on joints that aren't wired to handle that kind of strain, like your knees, your hips, and your back. 
do we need to explain this to anybody? I mean, ironically, uh, or maybe maybe not ironically, we all know that this is true for women in high heels, but it's true even if you're elevating your your heel a few millimeters, it can offset the way your body is functioning. Yeah, I mean, I've looked at like, I just to give a preface, um, I worked in a clinic that did chiropractic biophysics as a tech. So Ooh. I looked I looked at people's spines through X-ray. And through, you know, postural deviations. So we would do testing on people and find out, you know, if they had a high shoulder or low shoulder, um, if they had a twist in their torso, if they had forward head posture, you know, we'd check them and then we'd shoot x-rays and figure out how to like correct their postural deviations. And yeah. And a lot of times people have like a left or right leg short. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out how to compensate that foot from being one shorter than the other. And a lot of times they'll put a heel lifting on somebody. Jesus. You know, I, I got to tell you, it's one of my favorite things. Um, and by favorite, I mean, least favorite. When someone emails us to talk about having a leg length discrepancy, um, they'll almost always uh, say my doctor or my chiropractor said, because they want to back it up. Um, but my favorite is, you know, things like my doctor or my chiropractor said that, you know, my right leg is two millimeters longer than my left leg. And it's all I can do not to say, all right, um, if you can stand on either one of your legs and raise or lower your body by two millimeters exactly, I'll give you a thousand dollars. You know, <laughs> there's some things that in motion are not as relevant as when we're standing, for example. I mean, I have a good friend who has a leg length discrepancy, an inch and a half, because they wow. had to replace his femur and they had the wrong one and they didn't know it. Mm. And the guy has problems walking, but he has no problems running because running is basically hopping from foot to foot. He has to change his gait a little bit. It seems like it's a little out of sync, like ding, 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 because he can move one leg faster than the other because it's shorter, different moment arm. But suffice it to say, he can run pain-free, walking pain in the ass. So we're talking about bones and feet, okay. mal malalignment. Yes. And well, not just alignment, it's also the motion thing. So the fact that, so I like to say joints are there to move bones. And by the way, we, when we were talking before this, you mentioned you had been listening to a Rogan podcast. Joe Rogan had one of my favorite lines ever. He describes boxing as the art of using your muscles to throw your bones at people's face, <laughs> which I thought was brilliant. But um, so joints are there to move the bones surrounding those joints. If you put your foot in something that doesn't let it move, then as we know, you put your arm in a cast, it doesn't magically come out stronger. It gets weaker from lack of use. Same thing happens with your feet. So even if you have something aligned, but it's not functional because it's been immobilized for years, that's problematic. So, you know, what we try to do with zero shoes is we make things, wait, I'm going to grab a shoe. So we make things with a wider foot shaped toe box. So your toes aren't getting squeezed low to the ground and flat for balance agility. And we're not messing with your, uh, the elevating of your heel or a thing called toe spring that they build into shoes with stiff soles. They basically toe spring is that it rises up off the ground and can't bend down. And that's in there because when you have a thick soled shoe, if you don't build that toe spring and you're just slapping the ground and you can't really walk or run properly, but we got rid of that. So it's basically flat from ball to foot, crazy, crazy flexible to let those bones and joints move naturally. And the soles give you traction and protection, of course, but also let's talk about nerves. Um, you have a, more nerve endings in the soles of your feet than anywhere but your fingertips and lips. And that's for a reason. It's to tell your brain what you're feeling how you're interacting with the terrain you're on, what you're stepping on, what you're stepping in. So your brain knows how to move the rest of your body efficiently and effectively and enjoyably. And so if you're not getting that feedback, you know, numb feet are dumb feet. And so we build the soles to give your brain that safely, give your brain that feedback that it's looking for. And we made them really durable. So our soles have a 5,000 mile sole warranty, unlike modern running shoes where they say you need to replace them every three to 500 miles because the midsole breaks down this goes back to chiropractic things. So I saw a guy, I was in the Denver airport. There's a guy in front of me. His feet were so hyperpronated because the midsole of his shoes had worn down on the inside. And so his, everything was way out of alignment. And this says something about the times we live in. I posted a quick video that was like from the you know mid thigh down of this guy walking in front of me. And on Facebook, everyone's screaming, oh my God, those shoes are killing him. And on Instagram, everyone's screaming, stop body shaming that guy. <laughs> I'm shoe shaming the guy. And I'm not even shoe shaming the guy. I'm shoe shaming the company that made the shoes. Uh, but that argument didn't go over very well. <laughs> well, 
I think it's quite interesting that you've developed a uh, footwear um, that helps people function better. I got to tell you, my wife has my favorite line. She goes, there's enough shoe companies in the world. We don't need any more shoe companies unless your shoes change people's lives. And we say that we've done that because we hear literally, we hear from people all day, every day who say that. And we have, I mean, it's like 60% of our customers who own more than four pairs of our shoes. Um, there are people who, who email us saying they'll never wear another brand and their entire family owns over a hundred pairs of our shoes because when, and it's not from anything magical that we're doing, we're getting out of the way to let the body do what it's built to do, which I would argue is a, uh, um, something that in the chiropractic world makes sense. It's like, how do we get things working so that the body can do what's natural? And we're just starting with the feet by letting your feet do what they can do. And by the way, I had a guy, uh, there's a, a chiropractor who focuses on feet that I met one day and he did an adjustment on my foot and that first ray and basically, you know, cracked a joint that I didn't know existed. <laughs> and I thought he had broken my foot until I stood up and went, Oh my God, I've never felt this good ever. Um, that was a, a very entertaining moment. Yeah, I, I think a lot of times people don't realize how fixated the bones and the joints in their feet are. And yeah. there, there's many people, honestly, I don't think that actually go without having something encapsulating their feet um, from the time they wake up to the time they go to bed. No, I, I hear it all the time. My favorite one um, was actually a guy, one of the richest guys in Boulder, Colorado. And I met with him as a potential investor. And he said, well, um, you know, I can't really wear your shoes anyway because I have plantar fasciitis and I've had it for 20 years. I went, yeah, you can't have an inflammation for 20 years. So something else is going on. And he said, well, you know, it went away spontaneously for about a year and a half. On Okay. So you, what you actually have is chronically tight calves that are pulling on your plantar fascia from the proximal side. And it's a fake out. I said, how are you just like, you know, walking around barefoot in your house? He goes, are you kidding? I have hardwood floors. It's like, holy smokes, dude. Are you telling me that you think it's normal that you can't just walk on a hardwood floor in bare feet? That ain't Okay. So here's what I can tell you. Your feet have gotten so weak from being in orthotics, which were never designed to be something that you wear all the time, designed to help you heal, to help you adjust and kind of, you know, change the way your body's moving. And then you get out of them. But I said, you've been in them so long, your feet have gotten so weak, they're not supporting you. But I can give you some exercises you could do in front of your television for five minutes a day. And in a few weeks, you'll be able to walk on your hardwood floors. And if you really want to have fun, I could put you in a pair of our shoes, which there's research showing that just walking in shoes like zero shoes uh, builds foot muscle strength as much as doing an actual exercise program. And maybe six months later, I could have you running a 5K barefoot if you wanted to. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, um, just because I look like this doesn't mean I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I, I was a pre-med way back when. And I can tell you that my friends who went into medicine, they did not score as high on those tests as I did. So, you know, just FYI. So let me ask you, like, what, what are some foot exercises that you'd recommend to people to like develop stronger feet? Well, the simplest thing is just use them, like literally go out and walk, um, wherever you can on ideally walk on mildly unpleasant surfaces, like some pea gravel, for example. And the reason I say that is you can't, um, one of the biggest things that people do that can cause problems in the feet is overstriding, landing with your foot too far in front of your body, landing on your heel with your foot, um, dorsiflex. So your toes are pointing up to your knees because when you do that, a, you're putting excessive pressure on your heel, your leg is relatively straight. So that force is going through your joints, up your ankle, into your knee, your hip and your back, instead of using your muscles, ligaments, and tendons as one with one function, which is as joint protectors, stabilizers for balance, agility, mobility. But the other thing is by the time your foot comes down, if you're overstriding, your plantar fascia are fully extended and in a weak position when they're trying to be strong by supporting you. So if instead you walk on something that's mildly unpleasant, you tend to land with your foot more underneath your center of mass, engaging the plantar fascia, putting that arch into alignment. An arch is a super strong, stable structure. Whether you have high arches or low arches, doesn't matter. Arches are arches in terms of strength and stability. And so walking on mildly unpleasant surfaces is a good. Um, an actual exercise you can do while watching TV or standing up, you know, brushing your teeth or whatever is called short foot where you just have your foot on the ground and it's kind of an isometric exercise. There's a m small amount of motion. You want to try and keep your toes as relaxed as you can while you take that, that first med head and try to basically in, like shorten your arch, bring that first med head towards your heel. It's a very small motion and your foot will cramp. Not, I mean, you don't want to do it until it's really painful, but that just means you're not strong enough yet. 
So do short foot, just pull that first bed head in towards the, the heel um, without trying not to use your toes. Don't squeeze your toes into the ground and just do that. Um, you don't want to go to the, the um, cramping part. Just stop then and just do that repeatedly a few times. And you'll notice some interesting things. You might notice when you do that, you're actually also activating your glutes. Uh, because your glutes are, of course, responsible in part for external rotation. And often you'll see people who are internally rotated at the hip and the femur because they're either not using their glutes or they aren't using their feet. Or And these go back and forth. So like if you keep your feet planted and tense your glutes uh, and you don't move your feet, you'll see that your feet will, um, how to say this, your feet will try to internally rotate a little bit, but they actually don't, which actually builds an arch. So short foot's a really good one. Um, other variations like, um, you know, just pick up marbles with your toes, put a towel on the ground and just kind of scrunch it up towards you and then scrunch it up or unscrunch it away from you. If you look up foot strengthening exercises on YouTube, you'll find a bunch of them, but really r just using your body is a good one. And of course, running barefoot is going to build strength the most because it's putting you under the most strain, but you need to build into that super, super slowly by listening to your body, I say, take off your shoes, find a smooth, hard surface, take a super short run, like 20 seconds. See how you feel the next day. If you feel a little sore, muscular soreness, rest until that's better Then try it again. Uh, if you feel like you did something, you know, wrong, wrong, then you really want to pay attention to your form. Make sure you're not overstriding, get your feet underneath you. Think about lifting your feet off the ground instead of pushing off the ground. Um, and basically once you can do 20 seconds comfortably, add 10 seconds the next time and just build up slowly. But that but landing on the ball of your foot or, or midfoot and having to do that eccentric loading by letting your heel gently come to the ground, uh, by getting your foot in a proper position to begin with and using the plantar fascia properly, aligning your foot properly and doing that little eccentric motion when you're landing to the ground, that's going to build more strength Oops, than pretty much anything else you can do. But just like going to the gym, you don't want to do too much too soon. Well, there's some things that just popped up for me. And one of the, one of my questions is, um, I guess there's three in one. Um, do you think jumping jacks starting oh, yeah. up barefoot would be helpful? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, except for well, jumping jacks are good or even just, you know, jumping in some way. I used to be a competitive jump roper or rope jumper, depending on how you want to say it. Um, <laughs> that's a great thing to do, but you don't want to do that barefoot because with a good rope, you will undeniably smack your toes at some point. And man, that is really unpleasant. So, um, so Again, you know, we make shoes to basically barefoot inspired footwear. And um, there's a guy that I know, I can't mention his name. He's the CEO of a multi-billion dollar footwear brand. And he says, I only wear two shoes, yours and mine. <laughs> <laughs> and he's a jump roper and he wears ours for when he's jumping or when he's not doing something corporate where they need to see him in his shoes. So, so second question is yeah. functional stuff too, is uh, lunges. Mm -hmm. um, because that's kind of like a lower impact less aggressive. It's not running, but it's, it's getting full functionality within those feet. Like joints. Uh, it's a good one for glute strength, um, depending on how you do them. And I recommend reverse lunges where you're stepping back rather than stepping forward. Cause it's easy to kind of like put your foot way out in the air and just sort of fall onto your foot when you're doing forward lunges, but you can't do that when you're doing reverse lunges, you need to be balanced and you put your foot back and you make sure that it's, you feel stable before you then basically do the, almost the, the same motion, but reverse lunges. Are, I'm, I'm a big fan of those and sideways too. I like those also. Um, the, the forward ones just, and sideways also, it's a little too easy to fall onto your foot rather than feel stable and actually use your, the ability to, to your proprioceptive ability to make sure you're using the muscles and ligaments and tendons the way you want to, instead of the way you're accidentally doing it and reinforcing some bad motion movement pattern. You've made it to Cairo Hustle. Sit back and learn from the greatest influencers in the profession on the world's number one chiropractic podcast. This episode is sponsored by Imaging Services, Cairo Health USA, Cairo Moguls, Pure Cairo Notes, Titronics, Sherman College of Chiropractic, New Patients in a Box, The Influencer Authority Podcast Training, Mango Voice, Community Healthcare Resources, Life Chiropractic College West, Trackstat, and MSculpt. Let's hustle. And, and then, you know, people are watching. Um, we, we, we both live in Colorado. 
and, cool. and uh, I'm in Grand Junction. You're in Boulder. So we're about uh, six hours away from each other, if you can believe that. <laughs> yeah, not the way I drive, baby. <laughs> so just in, in the whole concept of where we lived, um, we have a lot of mountains out here. Yeah. And I know you started your business uh, 13 years ago. And uh, you said you started as a do it DIY build your own sandal kit. Yeah. Um, and I I've hiked uh, at least one 14 or a year since I've lived out here. So do you have uh, people that hike 14 ers that, that wear oh. your footwear? Oh, we have people who do everything in our shoes. Um, we had one guy who, who came out to Colorado and did like, you know, 10, 14 ers one summer in our sandals. Um, people have done it in our shoes. People have through hiked every major trail in the world in our shoes and sandals. We've got ultra marathoners. We've got um, ninja warrior athletes. We have professional power lifters, people who play dance, dance revolution, people who train in our shoes. So here's the thing. I'm not suggesting that you just switch cold Turkey to what we're doing. There's an opportunity to, there's a time and a place for things. If you're playing soccer on a muddy pitch, you need cleats. We're not making those yet. Um, <laughs> we have some runners who like to run in their whatever big padded motion control shoes and they feel great. I go, that's cool. There's research showing that if you have runners do an eight week foot strengthening exercise program, their risk of being injured is reduced by 250% over the course of a year. And I say a year because that's how long the study went, but here's where it gets more interesting. You can get the same benefits or that same exercise program is the one I kind of referenced before just walking in our shoes, build strength as much as doing that same exercise program. So there isn't yet a study showing you can just walk around in our shoes and then run in regular shoes and have a lower injury risk rate, but kind of do the math. The thing in the middle of that equation is the same exercise program. So if that makes sense, run in whatever you want, wear our shoes for other things, balance, agility, mobility, strength, et cetera. Um, but I literally can't think of an activity that people do where I haven't heard from someone doing it in our shoes. I mean, like, here's a weird example, backing up to the wear whatever you need to, and then wear our shoes otherwise. Uh, we have a few professional ice hockey players and Olympic ice hockey players who say as soon as they get out of their skates, they're wearing our shoes and the strength that they feel that they're building is translating to when they're in their skates. We've had um, a WNBA player who was living in our sandals when she was off the court. She said, my feet have become indestructible and I'm jumping higher and playing better and not getting injured the way I used to. So we're now working with some NBA guys to develop a basketball shoe. Well, I'm very well connected with a couple of the top chiropractic colleges that have uh, high level rugby teams. Ooh. So maybe we can talk to these guys about getting some of zero shoes on these rugby players. Well, <laughs> I'll tell you, we were talking to USA rugby and the idea was because a lot of those players, again, on a rugby pitch, you often need cleats and we're not doing that yet, but these are great products for again, walking around and then in the gym. Um, because they're flat, like if you think about power lifters or, or not just power lifters or Olympic lifters as well, but for power lifters who deadlift, good deadlifters are either barefoot in socks or in some flat shoe, like a Chuck Taylor, for example. And we've got a bunch of power lifters who, once they're in our shoes and their toes are spreading and able to grip the ground better, they're setting PRs in our shoes. And some of them are setting PRs in the bench as well, because if you ask them, they'll say bench pressing starts with your feet. Mm -hmm. And they weren't using their feet well before. So, you know, great products for being in the gym. So Life West Chiropractic College is one of our sponsors and they have a top level rugby team. And mm -hmm. uh, we'll talk to uh, the president of Life and see if we can get some uh, some shoes on these guys. Oh, that'd be a blast. I think it'd be really smart for us to get in with uh, the youth movement because all these people that are going through the chiropractic school, they're yeah. eventually going to become doctors. <laughs> well, you know, there's another thing. Um, Dr. Irene Davis from Harvard, when she was at Harvard, uh, said, if we just got kids wearing shoes like yours in 20 years, we wouldn't be treating adults for the billions of dollars of problems they currently have. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm looking for longevity and, and uh, how people can uh, have better quality of lives with your product. And that's, that's my, my, my big uh, proposition to you is next year. When I hike my next 14 er I'm going to wear a pair of zero shoes. Well, I recommend getting used to them first instead of just switching on day one and going up there. But I'll tell you about the longevity thing. Uh, balance is a big issue. There's a study that's getting started now using our footwear for balance in the elderly. And this one's near and dear to my heart because my dad is one of those many, many, many people 
who, when he was 80, tripped on some tiny little thing, um, couldn't write himself, fell down, broke his hip, and was dead two weeks later. Sorry. And things like that are, um, I, I would argue, preventable. When I mean, God, you watch the recommendations that uh, people who are doing gerontology say f- to their patients about footwear and they're putting them in these big thick stiff things where you can't feel anything and you can't move how could that possibly be good uh and it's not (laughs) is the simple thing so you know we're trying to change the world there too well i will definitely uh take take uh a bit of a lead in time before I go hike a 14,000 foot peak and a pair of your shoes. But um, let's talk more about your business. I, I know you sure. said the first year you did 50, 50 K something um, like that. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And, and 13 years later, you guys are doing 33.6 million. Yeah. Which la- I, 20, 2021, we did 33.6 net. And uh, tell us a shark tank story. Cause I know Kevin or you went on shark tank and you turned down Kevin O'Leary. Yeah, you can you can see the whole episode if you go to zeroshoes.com slash shark tank. Um, but um, the the short version is that we we spent a whole lot of time. Uh, we read all the autobiographies and biographies of all the sharks. We wanted to know how they thought and what they did. We talked to people who'd been on the show and asked their experience. We talked to bankers and investors and people who bought shoe companies and sold shoe companies to understand this weird thing you do in that show, which is uh, – you give them a valuation. So you say, I'm asking for expert, I'm asking for X number of dollars for Y percent, which is not how normal investing negotiations go. And we know they want to be able to talk you down. So you have to pick a number that is justifiable, but also lets you talk them down or lets them talk you down. And um, we offered 8% of the company for $400,000, which was a $5 million valuation. When we were at that year, we were going to do about five or $600,000. But we knew we could justify that valuation and we knew we were willing to go down to like, you know, two, 2.5. But Kevin came back and said, I'll give you the 400 grand for half the company. And um, Kevin also kept saying, I get it. I get it. It's a bunch of Indians running around the desert naked in peyo- on peyote. <laughs> and uh, they cut out the on peyote part when they aired the show. But afterwards, they asked Lena, my wife and I, what do you think about Kevin's offer? And she said, if he thought we were going to give up half the company, he was the one on peyote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you know i i i think that it's it's very unique um to, to create a product and a brand and a market within a huge market and to produce something that you love it's um people who know the footwear world have have said to us no one's ever done what you've done and i would argue that that's true um, and we've had multi-billion co- dollar companies um, threatened by us already. When we were a tiny little company, we got an order from a big retailer. And coincidentally, uh, we had also been in a small local retail store that's kind of a canary in the coal mine because they're really iconic. And the big companies check to see what's happening there to see what's new in the world and what you know what's going on. And we outsold a number of, when we only had sandals, we outsold a number of big sandal companies. And it just so happened that the parent company of one of those companies called this big retailer uh, right when our order was about to get placed and said, we don't want that brand in your stores. And they canceled the order on us. And I thought if a multi-billion dollar company is going after us when we are like a million dollar company, that's a good sign. Mm. Yeah, the threat was real. Yeah. And and they're seeing it now. I mean, it's it's the footwear industry is a people who get really terrified that they're going to go out of business because something other than what they're doing is getting popular. And then they'll either try to copy you or try to take you down. And there's not a lot of creativity in this space. Uh, if you look in a shoe store now, every sh- I mean, you go to a there's a an event called the running event, a big trade show for for specialty running stores. And if you walk around that show, other than ours, every shoe looks the same. You could swap the logos and nobody would know. Yeah, I think that the the, the trend is real when it comes to being novel, unique, and non-obvious. That's how you become patented. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> and I think a lot of times when people want to uh, play the... Well, my, my, my friend married a Thai, Thai gal, and uh, he went over and visited her in Thailand like, I don't know, 18 years ago before they got married. And they went back and like visited family. And uh, he's like, bro, I found like Gucci handbags on the street. 
And I found like Prada handbags on the street and like the people selling them will come up to me and they'll say, same, same. It's the same, same, like it's the same, but it looks different and it's a knockoff and people can have the same, same all day, but it's not going to have the same performance and integrity as a brand that is like yours. We hear, we hear it all the time on Amazon in particular, there's a number of companies that took what they were calling water shoes and rebranded them as barefoot running shoes. And um, they're half the price of our running shoe, but they also last about a 10th as long. And, um, and also they don't fit properly. So I've had a number of people say to me, well, I already got, you know, that fill in the blank shoe from Amazon. So it's the same idea. I go, let me, let me send you a pair of mine. And without, <laughs> without exception, they email me back or call me back and go, oh, dude, I had no idea. This is a completely different experience. Yeah. And I, I, I have to ask you. Um, who's your ideal customer? Like who, who do you want your shoes on? Uh, people with feet, preferably two, but not required. <laughs> and, and as far as that being a pun <laughs> answer, um, <laughs> well, look, I'm, I mean, it, it's, it's a glib answer, but I, but I'm literally serious because it's not about who they are. It's about what you're doing. So if you're looking to be in a high heeled, you know, whatever, that's not our thing. If you want a high fashion thing, that's not our thing. If you're super rich and you only buy shoes that cost a thousand dollars, that's not our thing. Um, right now, but And what we've seen is that the benefits of natural movement are so vast, there's literally no one who can't benefit from what we're doing. So, um, and when I joke and say, you know, preferably too, we have had people who've come back from the military with amputee, amputated limbs who put on one of our shoes on their good foot and one guy who showed that he put our, his other shoe on his prosthetic, which I thought was brilliant. Um, so mm-hmm. right now what's happening is we're still kind of in that early adopter stage. I and mean, we, we've probably sold about a million pairs of shoes. Um, but that means that it's still early adopters because so many people buy so many pairs of our shoes. They get so ad- addicted to the natural movement experience. They don't want to wear other things. And um, uh, so it's health and fitness minded men and women, basically. I mean, think whole food shoppers. And, yeah. and that's not just people who are like outdoor friendly, fit, et cetera. It's also people who are health and fitness minded because they need to be, because they have some issue that they're dealing with and they've tried everything and they don't know what to do. And they've heard that maybe there's some way that we can be helpful. And while we can't make medical claims, um, if you read the almost 60,000 reviews we have, people have commented how about how almost any issue that they've had um, has surprisingly been helped by letting their body do what's natural. Again, this shouldn't be surprising to chiropractors. Yeah. Well, in chiropractic, one of the phrases that I really have adopted is the issues in the tissues. <laughs> I, like and, you know, I want to address something really quickly. It just popped in my mind because I know there are a number of chiropractors who make quite a bit of money by uh, prescribing orthotics and, and insoles of certain kinds. And I'm not going to tell you not to do it because there are times where it's appropriate. But what I'll tell you is something a little more interesting is uh, our f- shoes are the best platform for an orthotic. If you're going to be doing that, because there's nothing getting in the way of the geometry of the orthotic, it's got a flat sole. It's a wide surface. Um, and so you're not having some built-in art support that's getting in the way. And you're not having a midsole that breaks down and changes the biomechanics of that person because of the shoe and therefore impacts, you know, what the orthotic is or isn't doing. Yeah. One of my, one of my favorite guys out there that's in the foot industry, um, he created insoles Mm -hmm. and, uh, he, the one of the lines that I always remember is he's like, I want you to be walking your dog when you're 80 and not a cane. Oh, nice. <laughs> Speak, speaking as someone who just got his first dog um, and my wife, our first dog six months ago, I really like that one. Um, in fact, with our dog, I want it when I'm 80, I want to be able to chase after him when he's chasing after a bunny. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it, man. Uh, this has been a really, really great conversation. I, I, there's more I have. Can, can we go a little bit longer? Yeah, yeah, of course. So marketing, um, when was your major jump and what did you do to go from like a, like say your first million, what did you do to like jump from a million to the next jump or what was same old, it? Same old. It, it's just doing more of what we are already doing. So the, the two biggest things that we do is make new great products. Every year we launch new products. Um, we add to the product line based on hearing from our customers. Cause once they, again, once they get used to what we're doing, they want to keep having that natural movement experience. So it was like, uh, our, the first thing we did um, when we were making just sandals is people said, well, what do I do when it's cold and I have to go to the office? 
So we made a closed toe canvas shoe. And they go, that's great, but I could use a running shoe. So we made a running shoe. That's great, but I'm on trail. So we made a trail running shoe. I mean, a lot of it is really hearing from our customers. And also we got a great product team with a lot of experience so they can identify where there's some holes in the product line as well or some ideas that we have a hunch will work because we just kind of, we just got a good feeling for that one. Um, so product is, is the driver. And then after that, it's just getting the word out and being very, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Actively communicating with our audience. So we're very active on social media. We respond as much as is humanly possible to everybody all the time. And we're trying to get better at that. In fact, we're growing so quickly, we need to hire people just to monitor social media. Um, we can't have just our customer happiness team doing that when they have a spare moment. Um, the, I, I create a lot of content. I create a lot. I, I make a lot of videos both about what we're doing and the problems with what people have been doing up until then. Um, we, we give away as much as we can. We really just try to, the first thing I did when I started the company is I made videos basically showing how someone could rip off my entire company. Here's how I got materials. Here's how I make them. Here's what you do. Here's how to make your own sandals with whatever materials you can find. It just so happened that we were selling better materials at a better price all in one place. So that's what's referred to in the marketing world as moving the free line, just stuff that you would otherwise charge for, give it away. Um, and um, we're very, uh, how do I want to put it? We have a very, I don't want to say aggressive, um, active, um, robust email campaign. So we're emailing our customers weekly with a newsletter where we try to be providing valuable information, entertaining information or entertaining something, content. Um, we have something that's happening now. The guy who created, kind of catapulted the whole barefoot running idea into the mainstream was Chris McDougal with the book Born to Run back in 2009. And Chris has a new book coming out called Born to Run 2 that's a practical version, how to actually become a happier, healthier runner, walker, hiker, et cetera. And he's in love with what we're doing and we're working together. So, um, but frankly, word of mouth has been the biggest driver. So taking all of that user generated content as it's called, basically all the reviews, all the videos, et cetera, and repurposing those and finding people who have uh, some leverage, you being one of them, frankly, finding people who are already talking to an audience receptive to what we're doing, hopefully receptive to what we're doing so that we don't have to go to people individually, but we can find people who, uh, who can tell a good story and they have a good audience and helping them as well. So we're not just trying to have them be useful for us. We want to be useful for them also. And there's various ways we do that with our marketing. But it's funny, the question you ask, back in early 2020, we were looking for some investors to help us because we just needed more cash to keep growing the business. And one guy said, I don't want to hear your change the world nonsense that you're going to be a billion dollar company in however many years, whatever. I just want to know how you're going to get to 40 million with 10% uh, profit because that's all I care about. And I go, just by doing what we're already doing. And he just never believed me. At the end of 2021, I sent him an email with the subject line, is it too rude to say I told you so? <laughs> he was very gracious. Well, you have a knack for making me uh, making me laugh, so I really appreciate that. Um, <laughs> My pleasure. You know, the, the, there, there's a big question for me because I think that we find like motivation, inspiration from other people. And I like this part of our segment because um, I, I'm really curious, like who are some of the people that inspired you? Um, who are some of your heroes who like helped you become uh, the entrepreneur that you are today? Um, boy, that's a weird question for me. I don't um, pay a lot of attention to other people, not because I'm a raging narcissist, but because I don't know who they are. I mean, I don't know other than, you know, this, what we see publicly of them. And I know there's more behind the scenes because in a different life, um, I'm friends with a bunch of people's gurus. And so I know what they're like when they're not out there doing their guru gig. And um, that kind of mm, eliminated my sort of mythologizing other people thing. Mm. I've also met a lot of people who are you know, very quote unquote successful. They've made a lot of money doing things and they're miserable or horrible human beings. Mm. Um, I've met really great marketers who have gone, you know, made millions and gone bankrupt and made millions and gone bankrupt. And it's like, I, I don't want to emulate them. I want to learn the things from them that are useful, but I don't, um, I don't have idols per se. I will, I I'll give you two that I get a kick out of though. Um, Sydney Pollock, writer, director, actor, producer. 
I always admired him because he did all of those things well. He didn't pigeonhole himself. He was able to do a lot of different things really well. Um, and that's something that I like to think that I can do as well. And I, I actually have a degree in film, a master's degree in film from Columbia University. And one of my favorite uh, lessons that I got there, there was two. On the first day, we had a session with a guy named... Um, Oh gosh, Frank, I just blanked on Frank's last name. I'm horrible with names now that I'm 60. Frank Danielle. And Frank became the uh, head of the American Film Institute. But he said, if you're a writer, a screenplay is about 120 pages. If you just write two pages a day, at the end of the year, you'll have three first drafts. And then you can go back and you know edit one and work on another. And so you know that's how you can be really prolific, a little bit every day. Now, I try and do a lot every day, but that little bit every day was really, really, um, that was really valuable for me. And then uh, the director, Milos Forman, the now late director, Milos Forman, somebody once said to him, how do you make a good movie? And he says, he's from Czech, the Czech Republic. He says, well, you know, 90% of making movies is uh, casting. And the other 10%, it's, uh, it's also casting. And, and I met the actors that he cast in his movies, and he was right. He just cast the perfect person. There was a very little stretch between who they were for real and who they were on screen. And I, so I say the same thing about business. It's like, you know, it's 90% luck that got us here. And then the other 10% is also luck. But then there's a separate hundred percent where it's 90% working your ass off and 10% hopefully being smart enough to figure out what to do to put out the fire that started overnight, despite the fact that nothing changed. So Milos was um, a big inspiration for me as well, because it's really like, all I need to do is the part that I'm responsible for and not complain about this stuff that's out of my control. And then just figure out a way around that. Like, this is going to sound weird. My dad grew up um, in Reading, Pennsylvania, and he was subjected to a lot of anti-Semitism. And when I was a kid, he made some comment about dealing with anti-Semitic things. And I said two things to him. I said, first of all, that hasn't been my experience. I haven't had anything where what people think I am has gotten in the way. And if I do bump into someone like that, I'm just going to find someone else to work with. Why do I give a shit what someone else thinks about me? Yeah, you, you're you're mentioning um, congruency. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. And you know, that's the underlying you know approach that you've found inspiration in other people is congruency, um, being good at something and being congruent with not pigeonholing yourself. Um, finding inspiration in somebody that casts well and finding why it worked. Well, that's being congruent. It's also, you know, there's another thing which is not settling for what people think is the truth. Like I'm always curious to find out, is there something more essential underneath the way people are thinking about it? And usually you get way past, you know, you get easily past what the common wisdom is because that's usually, uh, it may be common, but it's rarely wise. But then getting underneath and underneath until you just, you know, can't get any further is really, that's always been compelling to me. Well, I mean, even with us today, your episode 445 of our show, but over the past five years, I've done over 1100 interviews. Oh my God. So when wow. you think about it, I always tell people don't go um, a mile wide and an inch deep. I tell them to go an inch wide and a mile deep. I say go a mile wide and a mile deep. <laughs> I mean, again, you know, look, and that's only because I'm, I'm, I'm old enough that they didn't have Ritalin for me when I was a kid. So, um, but I mean, that, that, that's just the way my brain works. I go really wide and then I go way deeper than most people in most of those things. Uh, look, th this is going to sound like I'm being self-aggrandizing, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I got invited to be part of a think tank. It was a one day thing with some guys who came in from MIT. They had a patent on some technology. They were trying to figure out what to do with it. And they got a bunch of people in a room, about seven of us in a room. I was the only one who didn't have multiple PhDs in various topics. But what became obvious to all those other PhDs was I knew enough about their weird little areas of expertise to talk about it intelligently and ask them interesting probing questions. Um, until finally, like the fifth one just turned to me and went, who are you? <laughs> and I said, I'm just a guy who gets bored easily and likes to learn really interesting things. And you're all really interesting. That's cool. 
That's cool. Well, <laughs> in, in, in business sense, yeah. um, sometimes chiropractors have a hard time running a business. So I think that there's some good things that we shared within this conversation today. And, you know, there's people that I know that have um, leadership in 10 offices or 30 offices or even 100 offices. And sometimes I find that there's people out there that have a really challenging time running one. So it's cool to see that you've been able to take your idea 13 years ago and create full circle year after year after year after year and stay on vision and to create this uh, great business that you have. Well, A, thank you. And B, again, I'm never going to under, uh, never going to overestimate, underestimate. I'm never going to um, dismiss the unbelievable value of luck and things that have nothing to do with me. And, uh, and look, frankly, the biggest one is the amazing woman that I'm married to. When I first met her, she avoided me like the plague for four years and then decided that I was okay to be her friend and then decided um, three years later that um, you know maybe we could be a good couple. And we've been together. We've been married for 19 years. We've been together for 24 years or something. Um, were it not for that, this wouldn't have happened. And happily, she thinks the same of me. And that was the most unpredicted and unpredictable thing possible. So, um, you know, again, you, you work as hard as you can about all the things you can control. And then after that, cross your fingers, man. Um, you know, the world could blow up any day now. And, and um, I, I want to have a fun ride along the way. Well, I look forward to being your friend for a long time. And uh, <laughs> I want people to go check out your uh, website, zeroshoes.com. And uh, I think that we had a really uh, powerful conversation today about footwear and chiropractic and business and uh, doing the right thing at the right time with the right people with the right intention. And I think that there's a lot to be said about that last statement. Yeah. And, um, you know, there is issue in the tissue. Um, and a lot of times it comes from your feet and it goes all the way up to the brain. And uh, sometimes people don't realize that the better that their proprioception is and their balance is, that the better quality of life they have. And as we discussed in the middle of the interview is that they're less of a liability to their loved ones around them when they have yeah. more mobility and when they have better balance in the footwear, they have better longevity and quality of life and better health. And with that, um, I thank you for being in episode 445. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's... Uh, it's a powerful thing that we do over here at Cairo Hustle, and I'm going to close out by telling everyone that you're just one story away. Keep hustling. Thank you, Stephen. Pleasure. All right. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to Cairo Hustle. Don't forget to subscribe and check back next week to continue hustling.